morning, good afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are, and welcome to the Child Safety Network's Protecting Kids in Cars Approaches to Child Passenger Safety webinar. Next slide, please. Uh, Children's Safety Network is a project supported by uh, HRSA and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and uh, you can read the rest of this, but um, this information and content in this webinar um, are, the, are those of the author and should not be construed as official positions or policies, nor should any endorsements be inferred. Uh, before we get going and I introduce our speakers, we have a few technical announcements. Kristen? Yes, so um, it's best if you join this webinar using audio via your computer, if possible. And if you experience any audio issues, you can dial a phone number found in the Zoom invitation and then mute your computer speakers. You are muted and will remain muted throughout the entirety of the webinar, and you will not be able to turn your video on or off either. Um, there is a Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen. You can feel free to add any questions at any time throughout the webinar. There will be a 10-15 um, minute Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This session is being recorded and you will be sent the recording link and we will have the recording link, the slides, and the resources shared in the chat available on the website within one week after this webinar. If you need to use captions, you can click the three dots and the more button on the bottom right of your screen. Then click the captions icon and it'll turn on automatic captions for you. And throughout the webinar, there will be resource files and links shared in the chat. So feel free to take a look at those. Great, thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for today. Joe Colella is the Director of Child Passenger Safety for the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association, or JPMA, as some of you may know. His role includes working with car seat manufacturer members towards safe regulations and standards, monitoring and providing input to state legislation, communicating safety messaging through the media and other venues, and working closely with partners on collaborative projects. Joe has been a child safety advocate for three dec decades, regularly acting as a writer, presenter, instructor, and spokesperson. Cassandra Herring, or Cass, as we all know her, manages the child passenger safety programs at Safe Kids Worldwide um, and is the liaison, coalition liaison for program and grant management. She provides field management for inspection stations and oversight for CPS related projects in the program management tool. And prior to joining Safe Kids Worldwide, she was a CPS technician instructor, program management and tribal liaison, uh, sorry, held those roles at the Oklahoma Highway Safety Office, Safe Kids Oklahoma and the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I am Morag Mackay. I am Chief Research and Network Officer at Safe Kids Worldwide and an active member of the Children's Safety Now Alliance. Again, a quick reminder, as we go through this presentation, please put your questions in the Q&A and we will hopefully get to them at the end of the presentation. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Cass and Joe to present. Thank you so much, Morag. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to do this. And um, really a, a lot of what Cass and I are going to be talking about is, is high level. There's a, there is a lot to child passenger safety. Um, those of you who um, have been trained in child passenger safety formally know that it's a three to four day class to become a certified technician. And that's just car seats 101. Um, so we're going to do this at a high level. And our, our goal is really to help you improve your programming and improve your um, improve your efforts so that um, parents and caregivers can get the right messaging and, and are empowered to protect their kids. Um, so I, I'll go ahead and I'll get us started. Can we click on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about here is, um, is a, a, how a crash um, interacts with a child or how a child interacts with crash forces. And um, before we before we start the video, and um, we, we actually only have to hit the next button for that video to start, but not, not quite yet. 
Um, the um, cra crash forces are representative of crash energy. There's a lot of energy in a crash. Um, hundreds or even thousands of pounds of force are required to properly restrain an occupant, depending on the occupant's uh, size and depending on the speed of the crash. And a lot of times what we look at um, as, as advocates, and many of you on the call may have seen this before, is, is slow motion videos of what's happening during the crash. Um, usually those are slowed down to about one thousandth of their real speed. Um, so it looks like a, a very gentle process of, of restraining a child. And it's um, that's a little bit misleading. So we're going to show a, a crash in real time and kind of experience those forces. Um, don't blink because you will miss it <laughs> if, if you do. Um, but yeah, if you go ahead and hit the advance button, um, it'll play automatically. Yeah. And I didn't get sound on my end. Um, but there was sound, but that's that's okay. It's not it's not important. But actually, you can hit the, hit the back button and then hit that again. Sure. Let me just. Yep. I want to make sure I can get the sound. Um, I think I may have to share. Uh, if you want to wait just one second, I should stop sharing and then share Lauren, to get the sound. Lauren, no? it's just, it's just it's just a big bang, and that's oh. the only one that has sound in it. So oh, I'm, I'm not okay. All right, it. here goes that. Um, so, um, so um, really, what you're what you're looking at is. Um, the, the the vehicle part of the crash. Um, and um, there's a lot going on inside of that vehicle. And if you advance to the next slide, please. Um, one more advance. Okay. Um, what we're going to look at now is what might be happening inside of the vehicle. And um, what we're trying to do is, um, is, is take those crash forces, the, the, when, when energy is transferred to tissue, that's what causes injury. And in this case, it's kinetic en energy. Um, so we want to minimize that um, the, the potential for injury. We want to minimize the amount of, of crash force that a child experiences. So part of that is getting kids into car seats. And part of it is getting them into car seats correctly. Um, so in this video, this is also a, a real-time video. Um, where you can actually watch a crash test happening. But in this case, I'm going to warn you in advance that the, the harnesses that are on the child dummy are a little loose. And so it is not going to perform the way it's designed, tested, and intended by the manufacturer. So go ahead and, and play that video, please. Okay, so you can see that there's an attempt to manage crash forces by putting the child in a child restraint. But because those harnesses are loose, the child or the dummy in this case um, is partially ejected. So those forces are not being managed and transferred away from the child as effectively as they should be. And that's why um, a lot of what Cass and I and Morag do is help people to understand correct use. Uh, if you go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Thanks. So really what we, we, we just witnessed in those two videos was um, in the first one, we, we witnessed the vehicle crash. Um, and everything that we, we talk about is based on um, the laws of physics. And the, the law that we're going to focus on here is Sir Isaac Newton's law of motion, um, which says that everything in motion continues in motion at the original speed until acted upon by an outside force. So the first um, the, the first video that you saw um, was the vehicle crashing into something. Now, we're not transferring energy away from occupants in that case. The, um, so um, the second part of it is everything inside of the car was still moving. In that case, it was a 35 mile an hour crash into a wall, was still moving at 35 miles per hour until something stopped it. Now, that could be something friendly, like a seatbelt and airbag, like a child restraint. Um, but um, it could also be something that transfers energy in injurious ways, like the steering wheel that you see in the image in the in the um, center image, um, or the the windshield or the the um, the pavement outside, um, a, a variety of different different things. So um, the the third crash is everything inside of our bodies keeps moving too at the original speed. So still moving at 35 miles per hour. Um, so our internal organs, our, our liver, spleen, intestines, heart, lungs are all still moving, brain, all still moving at the original speed. And that's the crash. When those stop into the, the parts of the body that have already been injured by the human crash, 
um, those are the ones that cause the most significant injury. Those are the ones that we're um, we're we're trying to um, really protect against. So we can't do anything to manage ener energy and transfer it away from humans with the vehicle crash, but we can limit the human crash and the um, and and by doing that, limit the internal crash. Okay, we can go ahead and advance. So I think, you know, we talk about why we do this, right? And look at the evidence behind um, processes that are put in place and the research that's done to help protect kids um, in, in car seats. Um, right here, we're looking at the AAP's uh, clinical practice um, guidelines and how they create those and review those and, and making sure that they're evidence-based, that they're reviewed in an unbiased way making sure that those are implemented, um, dis disseminated, and we're updating information as we go along. Um, we wanna ensure that the information that we're providing for best practice and using car seats correctly um, go in accordance with the guidelines of manufacturers as well as um, the research that is being done. Um, next slide. Um, a great place to find um, information about crashes, um, and the most recent data that we have is from 2021, is um, NHTSA's Traffic Safety fa uh, Fast Facts. Um, so we can see that where injuries have occurred, and we know that motor vehicle um, crashes are one of the leading causes of death um, for kiddos under 14. And on average, we know that about three children are killed uh, and 445 are injured every day. We can look at statistics um, and know, you know, that those are kind of relative, right? But if we put it into numbers of children killed and injured each day, we can really see what the severity um, of these injuries are, are occurring and we can translate that to education to parents and caregivers um, that we're working with on a daily basis. Um, of the children that were killed, um, 36 to 40 percent um, were unrestrained. So there's a variable there because in crash reports, um, sometimes we have an unknown on whether the restraint was used or not. Um, so that 36 percent is um, the number that was known, but it could be up to 40% if we had all of the information in some of those crash reports. Um, nearly half of car seats are critically misused. So as Joe kind of showed us in that video before, if a car seat is there, but it's not being used properly, a child could actually come out of that car seat and it's not gonna mitigate those crash forces the way that it's intended to be used. Um, so looking at overall misuse, um, depending on where we're getting our data, those rates are much higher. Um, if we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so this is something that I like to look at because you can kind of see the breakdown. This is um, from FARS, um, but you can see the breakdown of crashes, where they happen, and what type of child restraint was used, whether a child restraint was used, um, seat belt use, um, and kind of look at where we have higher numbers, right? So we see that of the number um, of fatalities um, in children, that that range is a little bit higher in that one to three um, age group. But if you look down to where we have um, seatbelt fatalities in that four to seven and eight to 12 age group, that's much higher. So to me, because I you know teach this, that indicates that maybe we have moved from a rear-facing car seat to a forward-facing car seat too soon or moved out of a car seat too soon into a seat belt. Um, so using a seat belt and not using it properly for the height, weight, and age of the child. Um, and these numbers can help us kind of direct where our programming should be going, making sure that we're addressing the right age groups. Of course, we wanna make sure that all kiddos are restrained properly. Um, but this give us, gives us an evidence base as to um, helping inform our programming. Next slide. We also know um, that research changes, right? So um, 
if you have been in child passenger safety, you probably are aware that, you know, we previously had a recommendation to rear face children until two um, based on the car seat, uh, car safety seats for children rear facing um, research. Um, but, but in 2018, we provide, there were updated guidelines provided by AEP and we'll go over those guidelines in a little bit. Um, after reviewing some of that research, um, they realized that there weren't, there wasn't a big enough sample size to um, continue to support that rear facing until two. Um, the, the, the recommendation is still rear facing as long as possible, but weren't able to put an age on it because of the limitations of the previous research. Um, so that's why it's so important that we are not only looking at new research, but also reviewing older research to ensure that it, it still um, is accurate with the new technology and information that we have. Next slide. I think we have a, a poll here, is that correct? Okay. So if, if you can just, Go ahead, go ahead and um, click your answer to, to that question. Um, and that could be based on your previous knowledge or it could be based on what, what Cass just told us. Okay. So the, the, the poll was closed and, and most of you um, got the answer correct. Uh, the, the correct answer was, um, was until the child meets the rear facing height or weight limits of, of the, the child strength that they're riding in. Um, now, those of you who have been around for a while um, know that all of those answers were correct at one point in time. They were all representative of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, recommendations, guidance. Um, but like Cass said, science continues to change. And as we get more information and corrected information, um, we're able to identify which guidance is, is uh, appropriate based on that. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and move to another E. That, that first E was the evidence E, where we, we talked about um, the um, how evidence um, inter intersects with uh, protecting kids in, in cars. Um, but let's talk about the engineering side. Um, the engineering side is something that that I work very closely with with through the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association. That is uh, my section of it is the car seat manufacturers that I, I work very closely with um, on um, technology and, and regulation and legislation and, and other, other items. Um, but car seats, um, have a lot of similarities to, no matter which model you have. And, and some of the similarities are, are the basic parts. They, um, they almost all have harness straps. They almost all have, or all of the current ones in the U.S. do have a, a chest clip or a retainer clip. Um, the forward-facing ones all currently um, have a top tether strap to um, enhance in, enhance uh, protection. But other than these basic parts that we're looking at, there are a lot of differences depending on which model of car seat um, you are um, you're using. Um, so we're going to talk about how how each of those models and each of those categories of child restraints might um, lend protection to a, a, a child in a certain age, developmental level, weight, height. Um, so go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Um, and really what the, the goal of it is just like for any restraint, we're trying to do five things um, for those children. So to, to reduce the severity of injury and, and avoid fatalities altogether. Um, one is we're trying to keep people in the car. Um, you're you're um, not protected outside of that passenger compartment or not as well protected outside of that passenger compartment, um, that reinforced compartment. If you were thrown out of the vehicle, just a, a fun fact, not so fun actually, um, is you are four times as likely to die if you're thrown out of the vehicle as is if you stay in the vehicle. 
Um, another thing that we're trying to do is to distribute forces to the strongest areas of the body, the body, the parts of the body that can withstand crash forces. So um, that's the the second thing that, that's important is making sure that the harnesses are on um, on the femurs and on um, the shoulders, not on the soft abdomen or not on the the neck. Um, in the in the case of lap and shoulder belts for, for shorter for shorter kids. And we also want to spread the force over a wide area of the body. If, we're, if we have hundreds or thousands of pounds of force, if we're able to spread that out over a wide area, um, it's going to help to make sure that not one area isn't um, that doesn't have all of the force acting on it or, or the, uh, uh, the lion's share of the force acting on it where injury would be more severe. Um, we're also trying to protect the head, neck, and spinal cord, obviously, because those are parts that we um, can't repair really well, but they're really important to us um, in, in living. Um, and we want to help the body slow down or ride down the crash forces with the vehicle. So really be coupled to the vehicle in a way that we're able to benefit from the vehicle crushing instead of us crushing. Um, transferring the energy to the vehicle. So those are really the five things that we're trying to do. And we'll look at um, the, the the different categories of restraints and how they do that. I, I think that we have another um, another poll coming up. Is that is that right? Okay. So go ahead and, and answer that one. And that one we haven't talked about yet. So this is based on your previous knowledge. Okay. So um, the majority of you got that one right as well. Um, the correct answer is the last one, until the, ch until the seatbelt alone fits the child correctly, fits the child as it fits an adult. So a little over half of you got that, that one correct. Um, but you will see the references to all three of the other ones elsewhere. So um, an age like eight it has is contained in the majority of state laws right now. A weight like 80 pounds has been contained in, in state laws and in, and in studies um, in the past. The, that four foot nine is contained in a lot of state laws, and it's, uh, but it's, it's not a magic number. Um, it does not, um, it is not a sure that um, that the child is going to fit. So the correct answer is when the the, child, the vehicle belt fits the child correctly. Um, go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Um, the, the bottom line is that children are not small adults and older children are not the same as, as younger children. Um, so as we grow, our um, what the, the image is, is attempting to show you is our proportions change. So when you're a brand new baby or when you have a brand new baby, the, the, um, the bulk of, um, of the child's mass is, is actually in their head. About 25% of their, of their mass is the, the weight of their, their head. And as we grow, they become more proportionate. As an adult, it's down to about 6% of your mass. Um, is is your head. Um, the structures that support the head change. The bones become more developed. The um, the uh, everything becomes a, a little harder. We're really flexible when we when we're first born. Um, so the 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 bones continue to ossify and the, the cartilage um, as we grow older. And we have to make sure that the way we're managing energy is appropriate for the child's um, age, size, and development level. Um, and you know, one of the quick, quickly, one of the anecdotal questions that I get frequently um, is, "My child is as big as I am. Can he ride in the front seat?" And this, it's not just about size; it's also about development. Um, does the child have the bone structure to keep the seatbelt in place? So um, it's not just size; it's it's size um, and developmental level and age. And age is the the time that it takes for that development to happen. Um, go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. So really what, what we're looking at is um, different restraints um, help kids at different age, size, and developmental levels. And um, our youngest children, like Cass mentioned when she was talking about the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation, um, our, our youngest children benefit from having support throughout the entire crash. And actually, if we could drive facing backwards, we'd all be safer this way because um, frontal crashes are 
um, the, the, the biggest share of, um, of crashes that produce injuries. Um, so um, if we go ahead and start the video on this, you can see looking at those five items that we're trying to do to manage energy. We're trying to keep the child in the in the car, um, first of all. And the way we're doing that is with the harnesses. The harnesses are on the hips and the shoulders of, of the child. Um, we're also trying to contact the strongest body parts. And children that are that are brand new don't really have strong body parts. So we're um we're we're spreading them across the entire back throughout the throughout the entire bend and really encapsulating them. We're protecting the head, neck, and spinal cord um, by um by providing support throughout the entire crash event. And um and we're allowing the body to ride down crash forces with the vehicle because the car seat is attached to the vehicle. Um, so really that's um, one method that, um, that is really important. And the, the current recommendation is the kids use that method as long as possible. So, you know, at their first birthday, just because some lo laws allow it, doesn't mean that they're magically ready to ride forward facing. Um, and the same, I think there are not, we're up to 20 laws that now say kids have to ride until they're two years old, we're facing. Um, and people, some parents think of that as a magic number. I, I need to turn my child ar around now um, because they're, they're two. Um, but that's not really the case. A, a child would be better off as long as they can use this type of technology or this rear facing technology would be better off statistically if they, if they stay rear facing. Um, we can go ahead and advance to the to the next slide. Um, the next step, once a child outgrows that rear facing um, car seat, is um, so th they've outgrown either the weight limits or the height limits for that for that rear facing car seats, and they've met the minimum age requirements for a forward facing car seat, which varies by by model. Um, then that's their next step is to is to um, is to transition to forward facing. We want to delay that transition as long as possible. So in this video, this is also a 30 mile an hour frontal crash, um, just like the last one was and this whole series is. And we're going to look at what happens with a, a three-year-old in a properly secured uh, forward facing car seat. And again, we need to focus on those energy management functions. So you can see that, um, that the the child is kept or the dummy is kept inside of the vehicle by the harnesses primarily. Um, the harnesses are properly positioned on the child and the, the harness clip is, is, helps to keep them that way. Um, we're contacting the strongest body parts. The, the, um, the harnesses go over the shoulders. They go over the femurs, um, which are the strongest, strongest parts of the body. It's a five-point harness, so they're spread over a wide area of the body as well, distributed. The crash forces are distributed. Um, reducing the severity of injury. Um, we're protecting the head, neck, and spinal cord. And in this case, the, the still image that remains on your screen is perfect for this um, because there's a, there's a top tether strap that only about half of parents use, um, at, at least uh, according to our, our checkup event data. But um, but the, the top tether strap holds the top of the car seat back against the vehicle seat and reduces the amount of forward motion that the child experiences, which means the child's not as likely to have head contact with the back of the front seat. And head injuries are um, a leading injury type um, for children riding in the back seat. So using that top tether and adjusting your harnesses for the correct height for that child, which would be in this case at or slightly above the child's shoulders um, and, and tightening those harnesses is what's going to protect the, 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 the child's head. Um, and of course, we're also trying to ride down crash forces with the vehicles and that top tether and lower, lower attachment um, are combined to um, to help achieve that, to help us to slow down with the vehicle rather than separately from the vehicle and take advantage of the, the crushing metal, transferring the energy away from the child. Next slide, please. Okay, one, one more slide. There we go. The, 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 the next um, phase of restraint that we want to delay transition to, so the correct recommendation for the forward facing that we just finished is from the time a child can no longer ride rear facing, they've outgrown the height or weight limits for rear facing and met the minimum age requirements for forward facing. And they should ride in a forward facing car seat uh, 
all the way up until they meet those limits. So the height limit or the weight limit of um, forward facing. And I, I know I, you know, one, one question that, that came up um, from, um, from you, the audience that was pre-submitted was, um, was about whether you can lock the, the shoulder belt. Um, if you have a switchable retractor, lock the shoulder belt with, with a booster seat. And my first response to that is if I need to control behavior by locking that, um, by locking that shoulder belt and, and switching it to the locked mode, um, is that that child is probably at a, at a behavioral level where they could benefit from still being in harnesses, not being in a booster seat yet. Just because a child is age four or five doesn't mean you have to switch them to a booster. They can remain forward facing all the way up to 65 pounds or whatever the limits of that, that car seat are. But let's move on to booster seats. Once they have exceeded those requirements, um, a child rides in a booster seat, um, only a small percentage, but, um, under 50% of kids ages four to seven are riding in booster seats. Um, some of them, uh, I, I think it's uh, around 20% are riding in harnesses still, like we, we prefer. Um, but some of them have already transitioned to seatbelts or to nothing, um, no restraint at all. Um, and the, part of that is because people don't understand booster seats. So what you're seeing in this image right here, the still image, um, is that um, the child is sitting all the way back against the, the vehicle seat or the dummy in this case. It's a six-year-old dummy um, representing a 50th percentile six-year-old. And when they're sitting all the way back, they're able to bend their knees naturally over the edge. They couldn't do that over the vehicle seat cushion. You can see the vehicle seat cushion extends beyond the knees. Um, so they would have to slouch to bend their knees. Um, but the booster seat gives them a place to bend their knees. And also, um, you can see that the, the kind of artificial hips that are built into a booster seat, since that child's hips would not be fully developed, are holding the lap belt down on the, the child's bony areas, the femurs and, and, the, um, and the pelvis. Um, and it's also lifting the child up so that the shoulder belt, instead of resting on the neck, um, is on the child's collarbone across the child's collarbone, um, which is a stronger part of the body. We talked about that for energy management. So that's really what a booster seat is doing. And it's really important, the people on this call, a lot of you are educators. It's really important to understand the function of a booster um, because only half of parents are using them. Um, so we need to be able to articulate why booster seats are important and how they prevent injuries. So we'll go ahead and, um, and watch this video. Can we go ahead and start that please? So this six-year-old continues to move forward until something stops him. And you can see the seat belts are, are stopping him. But because of the booster seat, um, the lap belt is staying low on the hips. Um, it's staying on the pelvis. The shoulder belt is not um, causing any bruising or abrasions to the neck um, as it would if it was if it was riding high on the deck because it's it's properly positioned on the on the collarbone. Um, a, a lot of us in the field, a lot of parents, a lot of advocates are concerned about neck injury, um, serious neck injury as a result of the shoulder belt being high on the neck. Um, statistically, that has not been the, the concern. The concern is that when the shoulder belt is high on the neck, the child doesn't keep it there. They put it under their arm, they put it behind their back where it's not going to function as well. Um, but we do see bruising and, and abrasions um, from from improper belt positioning. The, the part of it, can we go ahead and start that video again? The, the part that we're most concerned about, thank you, the, that we're most concerned about is where you see that lap belt, the lower belt. Um, if, the boot, if the child was not in a booster seat and was at this developmental level, that lap belt would ride up onto the abdomen um, where it doesn't have the protection of a bone structure. So um, the liver, the spleen, um, and the intestines are far more exposed, the bladder, all, all more exposed. And, and the child could um, have serious internal organ injuries um, if not riding in a booster seat. And those injuries might not even be apparent to a first, a first responder without a full assessment. Um, pressing on the child's body and checking for tenderness as, as a start, looking for uh, a seatbelt tattoo um, by lifting up the shirt and looking for discoloration of the of the child's flesh um, as a result of where the where the belt was making contact. Um, so um, booster seat is really important and um, and it's really going to be the the longest um, the the longest period that you're you're riding in any one car seat. Um, 
the statistically we say ages four to seven, but most kids aren't ready to ride in a seatbelt until they are somewhere between ages 10 and 12 when the seatbelt alone fits correctly. Um, so go ahead and advance, advance to the next slide, please. Um, and this is a, a child, a six-year-old riding in a seatbelt. Let's take a look at what would happen without the booster seat. You can see the dummy is slouched downward to bend his knees over the edge. Um, for comfort purposes, and the lap belt is riding higher on the abdomen instead of on the hips. And as the crash begins, this 30 mile an hour crash, um, all of the force um, is transferred to the abdominal area. So again, the liver, the spleen, the intestines are what would be injured through this process. And the booster seat is going to help to prevent that by proper seatbelt positioning. And we can go ahead and advance from there to, for the purpose of time. Thanks. Um, and that, that graduates us once a child uh, fits correctly in the seatbelt and the seatbelt can um, sit on the low on the hips and, and across the, the, um, the chest and collarbone um, correctly without the use of a booster seat, that's when they're ready to graduate. Again, that's going to be sometime between the ages of 10 and 12 for most children in most vehicles, but it's child specific and it's vehicle specific. So go ahead and start that video. Um, this is a 10-year-old dummy, a 50th percentile 10-year-old. Now, you can see that even in this case, the child kind of slips out a little bit from under the dummy, slips out a little bit from underneath the belt, um, and the belt rides up a little bit onto the abdomen. So even this 10-year-old dummy in this seating position could further benefit from being in a booster seat that keeps the, the lower belt properly positioned um, on him. Uh, but this is this is probably a borderline case um, where um, you know you could go either way. But if you're going to err on the side of caution, even that ten year old would still be riding in a booster seat in this in this seating position in a, a vehicle seating position that looked like that. Um, so we'll advance to the next slide, and and I'm going to breathe, and Cass is going to take it away from here. Of course. So we've talked about a couple of other E's. Um, so education is really important in that. Um, education is really the key to our child passenger safety technician workforce um, and the work that they do in, in their communities. Um, we take the information from research and from manufacturers and um, implement that into like like Joe said, a three to four day training to give you, you know, the basics of child passenger safety, where to find the information and how to help better empower uh, caregivers to transport their children safely. Next slide. Um, one of the recommendations in our, our child passenger safety curriculum comes from NHTSA. Um, and please note that this is a range. So we do have a model of good, better, best. Um, and this range kind of encompasses recommendations from um, car seat manufacturers and also takes into consideration um, stages um, of development, height, weight, age, um, development level of children. Um, so our, uh, we'll talk about AP recommendations in a couple of slides, um, which goes to kind of best practice, um, but this is a good visual. Um, for parents and caregivers um, to kind of show what considerations um, we might want to look at. Um, and this is just kind of a beginning, a starting point for that. Um, next slide. Um, we do have some links that are in the chat, so you'll be able to kind of look at those. Here is the NHTSA or National Highway Traffic Safety Administration public site. There's a lot of great information about car seat and booster seat use. Um, they also do have a traffic safety marketing um, to where you can utilize um, those as educational resources uh, for the work that you're doing. Um, next slide. So here's the AAP um, recommendation. So all infants and toddlers should ride in rear facing car seat um, as long as possible. So that's basically until they've reached the height or weight um, allowed by the rear facing um, car seat. Um, most convertible car seats have limits that will permit children to ride rear facing for at least two years. Um, and currently we have a couple of seats that go to 50 pounds rear facing um, on the market. All children who have outgrown the rear facing height or weight 
um, of their car seats should use a forward facing seat as the next step um, with the harness for as long as possible up to the height weight um, limit allowed by the manufacturer. Some of them may have age, um, depending on when they were manufactured as well. Um, the next step to that, um, like Joe mentioned, would be our, our booster seat use. So after they've outgrown the height and weight of a forward facing car seat, they should use a belt positioning booster seat into the vehicle lap and shoulder belt, fit them properly. Um, you know, he talked about that four foot nine being kind of a relative number. So really wanting to focus in on that um, seat belt fit there. And then the last one, um, when children are, are old enough and large enough to use the vehicle seat belt alone, they should always use a lap and shoulder belt for optimal protection. Next slide. Um, this is the AAP uh, website, so you can find recommendations for AAP here. They also have a list of um, car seats that are available on the market. Um, at the AP website here, um, that link is is in the, the chat as well, I think, um, healthychildren.org, if not. Um, but that list of, of car seats that are available really go back to, um, if you suspect that a seat may not be, uh, maybe a counterfeit seat or a, not a legitimate car seat that meets federal motor vehicle safety standards um, in the US, you can check here. Next slide. Um, and of course, we have the Children's Safety Network uh, website, uh, Child Passenger Safety uh, topic page as well. Um, so feel free to reference that um, page whenever you're needing information about uh, child passenger safety. And um, I am I oversee certification. So of course, I want to show you um, the CERT site as well. This site um, allows you to find a child passenger safety technician that's in your area. Um, you can filter in the certification type for an instructor, a technician, um, or a technician proxy. Um, and you can also filter for extra training. Um, some of the extra training uh, that is available is someone has taken a school bus training. Um, we do also have a safe travel for all children um, transporting children with special health care needs, um, to which those technicians have taken um, additional training to help transport kids that may have adaptive needs or medical um, needs when looking at car seats. So um, I know one of the questions was a reference to children that might have disabilities that may require um, addi additional transportation um, methods um, and contacting a local technician that has um, had that training is going to be really helpful for you in working with um, your their physician team and OT or PT. Next slide. Um, and here's just a brief look at what is included in the child passenger safety uh, technician training. Um, so if anyone is interested, you can also go to cert.safekids.org. I look for a course near you um, and register for an upcoming course if you're not already a technician. I think we have a poll now. Is that correct? Yes. On this slide here. Yep. Who is the ultimate authority for ensuring correct car seat use? I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and do this. Um, the, the correct answer, um, not everybody got it right, um, not even the majority. So the correct answer is um, the, the manufacturer of the car seat model being used. They've designed it. They've tested it. They know how it's going to work best. Um, so um, just like with any other product, you need to use it according to the instructions. Um, and so they are the ultimate authority for correct use. Um, now, uh, the other options, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, provide good, useful information about general correct use. Um, and child passenger safety technicians are trained 
um, to follow the manufacturer instructions, but the manufacturer is, is the ultimate authority um, for correctly using their product. Um, next slide, please. Which is a great segue to this slide. Um, this is um, a... I believe this is going in the chat, jpma.org slash car seat help um, is, the, um, is the URL for it. Um, and this is um, just kind of a compendium of um, all of the manufacturer's customer service options. Do they do just phone customer service? Do they have email? Do they have text? Do they have online videos? What are their hours? Do they have video chat where, where they can look inside your car? Um, the agents can look inside your car and help you to troubleshoot problems. Thank you. Um, so um, that's just one resource. There's also a label on the side of every car seat that tells you what's manufacturer and how to reach them. Um, but we just try to make it a little bit easier. Next slide, please. Um, and we'll talk real quick about laws. Um, the, the, what we've talked about so far has been the laws of physics um, and specifically Sir Isaac Newton's laws of motion. And the closer we can get state laws to the, to representing that the laws of physics, the better. Um, if you can advance to the next slide, you can see that that hasn't, that hasn't happened as of yet. You can see there's quite a variety of state laws. Now, the majority of them are orange, um, which means up to age eight, age seven and younger, um, must be in a, in a car seat used according to the manufacturer's instructions. Some states haven't gotten anywhere close to that. Um, you can see South Dakota, as an example, is the one and only that um, it's just ages four and younger. Um, and they're the, um, the the bluish bluish states, I guess, um, are um, five and younger and then um, six and younger for the, the lighter lighter colored ones. Some states have gone way beyond um, where the the um, the uh, yellow orange states are eight and younger. So all the way up to age nine, you must be in a car seat. And Hawaii has taken the ultimate step of going all the way up to age 10. Um, so ages nine and younger must be in a car seat. Um, and these really represent um, closer to the laws of physics as they as they go to, to higher points. Um, and and they're, they're great sources of education. Next slide, please. And I'll just uh, I'll just run through enforcement real quick, and then and then uh, Cass is going to take the last E. Um, but enforcement is the next E that we're talking about. It's a very important part of this. Really, the purpose of those laws that we just looked at at the the upper age limit of um, are educational tools. That's how most parents find out how long their child must be restrained is by knowing what the law is, and they trust that the state law is going to provide them correct guidance. Crash dynamics don't change when you cross state lines. So we really need to get them all um, pretty, pretty similar. Good next slide, please. Um, but, but high visibility ability enforcement really aids in that education process. The primary purpose of that is um, to promote voluntary compliance with the law, to educate the, the, the public on what the how long their child should be riding in it in uh, a car seat, um, and, and then promoting voluntary compliance with that law. Um, if necessary, then, you know, there, there can be um, saturation patrols or checkpoints to assess how people are riding. Um, and um, even in the case of saturation patrols and, and, and checkpoints, like the click it or ticket process, um, letting people know this, we're going to be enforcing seatbelt laws and car seat laws for the next two weeks um, actually increases the deterrent effect of that effort. Um, and then tickets and fines are, are further um, reinforcement of you need to be riding in um, in, in a car seat and have, have your ch children correctly res restrained. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just wrote a comment on a, on a couple of Massachusetts bills this morning, um, and um, they are talking about increasing their fine from $25 up to, depending on which one they choose, up to $100 as additional incentive for complying with the law. Um, the next slide, the final E. So, you know, a really important thing um, across everything that we're doing in injury prevention is looking at equity. Um, Safe Kids Worldwide released our equity and child safety um, strategic plan. Um, and really going forward, we want to ensure um, that all children receive the information in a way um, that fits their needs um, in their communities. Um, and is conveyed by a, a trusted member of their community. And going forward, that will be our focus in, in programming um, 
And I think looking at child passenger safety specifically, we have to make sure that there are not only resources available, um, but educational tools that will um, reach the communities that, that we're trying to serve. Um, and also knowing that sometimes that means that we have to go into communities as opposed to being standalone inspection stations or um, if reassessing our models and understanding what the community needs are. Um, and I think that we have to kind of take a, a closer look at the information that we put out, um, making sure that we're utilizing different languages um, and, and different methods of conveying information. I think we are coming to a close and I think we have a few minutes for questions now. Yep, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, you just alluded to equity and one of the things that did come in was what can people do when they're looking for low cost or no cost car seats for families who cannot afford them? Of course, so every state is different, um, but you can check your local Safe Kids Coalition. Um, also, oftentimes highway safety offices fund um, programs for child passenger safety in, in most of your states, as well as there are other funding sources through, through some places that have um, some maternal and child health um, grants if, if your state has chosen to focus on child passenger safety. So um, there are many avenues, um, but if you're interested in connecting with a Safe Kids Co Coalition, you can either email me or um, you can find some of that information at safekids.org. Thanks. Another question that has sort of come in is what about rural areas? They are kind of an underserved area and maybe less likely to have technicians. What are solutions for rural areas? Of course. Uh, I think that that is one of the areas that we're we're looking at addressing, right? So when we talk about equity, it's, it's not just um, who are serving, but where they live, right? And their access to resources. Um, so we have undertaken at the at Safe Kids Certification an analysis of our workforce to see where technicians and instructors are and to um, compare that to where injuries are happening. And I think that if you have ideas or need guidance for implementing programs in rural areas, I'd love to have con further conversations with you um, about doing that. But I think that finding community partners that are already working in some way um, in those communities, whether it's in a transportation field or health, uh, child health or um, early childhood, um, that you can build that program into. It's easier to sustain than trying to build a standalone program that is very dependent a lot of times on grants. We want to make sure that we're sustaining people's salaries and time and also the program for, for longevity. So I think looking at it on a bigger scale is really important. So we talked about similar car seats, but they're still pretty complex. What can we do to simplify car seat instructions? Um, parents find them really hard to understand, and this often leads to errors in terms of installation. Yeah, that, that's a, a great question. I, I can assure you that a lot is being done um, in that area right now um, where manufacturers are starting to take a, a second look. They still have to cover certain information. They have to they, they have to make sure that the, the car seat is properly used. But we're starting to see more color coding of instructions. So if my child is going to be rear facing, I only need to read the blue section um, of, of certain instructions. Um, in those cases, some of them are supplementing their instructions by placing um, correct use videos um, on their websites that that can help us um, to to identify correct use. Um, some of them have even um, we're, we're just starting to see a movement toward going toward apps um, so that I do a step and then um, and then uh, move on to the next one after I've completed that one successfully. Um, and and even a few are starting to use quick start guides in their as part of their instructions where um, where I can at least get the basics of correct use and then dig back into the whole book for um, for additional information. So that's in, in process right now. But yeah, they are there. There is a lot of information in those instructions. Right. You're right. Towards the end of the presentation, you were talking about legislative solutions, and we have a question. Just wondering. Is the industry and our safe kids doing anything to advocate for an increase or an improvement in booster seat laws or having them apply to a 
to uh, higher ages. So I think, you know, uh, I'll, I'll speak for, for Safe Kids and I think Joe can probably talk about, about industry, but um, we do have an advocacy team and we're, you know, constantly looking at those things. I think that uh, Joe referenced the law that's in Hawaii looking at, you know, higher age groups and things like that. We're always um, open to providing language for things like that to help you advocate in your in your local states for um, laws that will support, you know, that evidence that we have now um, looking at, at FIT and, and those types of things. So um, definitely open to helping however we can. Yeah, and that, you know, just building on that, the, the law is a, a delicate balance uh, because it not only needs to represent the child's needs, like going up to age eight, nine, 10, um, but it also needs to reflect the currently available products um, and that both on the vehicle side and the child restraint side. So as an example, going up to age 10, um, if you're dealing with a, a child who is in the 95th percentile of child size, um, that can be a challenge because there may not be a car seat available to support that child's weight or height. Um, so it's it's really a balance. Um, and some states have actually started moving toward um, talking about the upper end being fit as opposed to an overall height like four foot nine or an overall age. And that, you know, that's a, a good chance for me to, to mention the, the five step test when a child is ready to get out of a car seat and be in just a seatbelt, which I see a couple of the questions um, re re refer to. Um, but the five step test is um, really in a nutshell, and I'm not going to go through all five steps, but it's can the child sit all the way back against the vehicle seat and still bend their knees over the edge of the vehicle seat um, is one, because that's going to help them maintain uh, their positioning throughout the ride. Does the lap belt fit low and snug on the hips and thighs? Um, does the shoulder belt cross the chest and the collarbone? Um, those are all important factors. And when all of those things are happening and they can be maintained for the entire ride, that's when a child is ready to be out of a, a um, car seat. Uh, if you wanted reference to the full five-step test, um, you can you can go to www.carseat.org, all one word, um, that's Safety Belt Safe USA, and they have um, a good representation of that. And actually the, the curriculum that Cass talked about um, addresses it in a similar way, um, just just not as the five-step test specifically. I really thank both of you. Um, we have a long list of questions we were unable to get to. We will take a look at those, though, hopefully, and maybe if you've got some answers, we can post those when we uh, post the slides and the recording of this. So thank you all of you for attending. Please look for the link to the evaluation survey in the chat and fill that out. Um, again, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Cass. I think we at high level scraped it, but I'm, I can see from the questions that you generated a lot of interest. Um, and, I, and I think um, there's a real opportunity for, uh, for you to connect with folks um, with answers to the remainder of those questions and also for them to just reach out to either of you um, if they've got additional questions going forward. Great. Thank you, Marek. Appreciate it. And thank you, Children's, Sa Children's Safety Network, for doing this. Thank you, everyone.